Hey everyone, so this is the beginning of my Swamp Thing coverage here on my channel. I'm going to be breaking down all of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing run, which is one of the most critically acclaimed historic DC runs ever. He revitalized the character, and uh, afterwards he went on to write Watchmen, the greatest graphic novel of all time, and uh, Alan Moore was such a big deal. He kind of jump-started the British invasion at DC Comics, where all of these Great uh, British writers came to DC and started writing, so we're talking Neil Gaiman, Grant Morrison, Mark Miller, Garth Ennis, some of my favorite writers, all kind of coming to DC because of Alan Moore on Swamp Thing here. Now, before I dive into Alan Moore's Swamp Thing run, I want to break down everything that happened to Swamp Thing before Alan Moore, because there was actually a lot of Swamp Thing before Alan Moore took over. So in this video, I'm going to be breaking down everything Swamp Thing before Alan Moore. So we're talking 24 issues of the initial series, plus 19 issues of the secondary series, and then Alan Moore's run will start on issue 20, which I will cover in the next video here on my channel. So I'm going to be covering a lot of Swamp Thing history in this video, and it is quite lengthy, but I'm covering a lot. Now, there are a lot of really kind of cool, good stories in here, even though it is from so long ago, from the 1970s, but we're going to have some Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane adventures with Swamp Thing, which are pretty fun. We're going to have the first few interactions between Anton Arcane, one of Swamp Thing's greatest villains, and uh, his interactions with Swamp Thing. So we're going to have him showing up a few times. All really exciting stuff. But there are also quite a few bad stories in here that are a real chore to get through. Whenever Swamp Thing has a sci-fi adventure, it's usually not the best. There's also this whole satanic subplot going on in the second series of Swamp Thing, which goes on way too long. <laughs> so I'm going to be covering everything, going issue by issue, but I am going to be skipping kind of through some of these issues that are maybe not the best, but there is a lot of good stuff in here. So I think this is going to be a really fun video, and uh, we're going to be covering a lot of Swamp Thing history. So let's dive into it now. Swamp Thing, the Bronze Age, everything leading, leading up to Alan Moore. Everything prior to Alan Moore's run on Swamp Thing is collected in three trade paperbacks called Swamp Thing The Bronze Age, Volume 1, 2, and 3, or in one gigantic Bronze Age omnibus. These trade paperbacks span the 24 issues of the original series, the 19 issues of the second series, as well as a few extra issues here and there in between. So this spans the years 1971 all the way to 1983. Alan Moore's very celebrated Swamp Thing run then begins at issue 20 in this second volume, which began publishing in 1984. So here is everything that happened to Swamp Thing before Alan Moore's run. First, we will begin with Len Wein's run. Len is the creator of Swamp Thing. He wrote the first Swamp Thing story, as well as the initial 13 issues of the first volume. While some of his issues are only okay, some of them are actually pretty good, and he establishes a lot of the character. I think his run is by far the best of the pre alan Moore Swamp Thing. So, there was an initial Swamp Thing appearance written by Len Wein, in a book called House of Secrets, issue 92, which was published in 1971. Now, normally our main Swamp Thing is a guy named Alec Holland, but in House of Secrets 92, that issue featured a different Swamp Thing named Alex Olson and his wife Linda Olson. This version of Swamp Thing would be ignored and forgotten about and redone the following year in Swamp Thing issue 1. It would not be until Alan Moore's run who would then repurpose that initial old issue and make Alex Olsen fit into the Swamp Thing canon. But here is the initial Swamp Thing story featuring Alex Olsen published in House of Secrets 92. Later on, we would be told that this issue took place in the early 1900s. So, in the early 1900s, Alex Olsen was a brilliant young scientist who met and fell in love with a woman named Linda. Alex's assistant, Damien Ridge, secretly wanted Linda for himself. Although Alex was his best friend, he could not abide letting Alex have Linda. In 1905, 
Damien waited until Alex had gone to bed, and then he crept down into the laboratory to tamper with Alex's experiments. He altered some of the chemical solutions in the lab and waited for Alex to resume his work. The following evening, when Alex attempted to complete his projects, the unstable chemicals exploded, nearly killing him in the process. Damien then dragged Alex's body out of the house and dumped it into the nearby swamp where he left him for dead. With Alex dead, Damien pursued and eventually married the now-widowed Linda. Damien never told Linda the truth concerning his involvement in Alex's death. As time passed, though, Damien began to believe that Linda suspected him. Damien, he could no longer endure his growing suspicions. Although he loved Linda, he was prepared to end Linda's life if it meant keeping his secret safe. What neither Damien nor Linda realized, though, was that Alex Olsen never truly died. His chemically bathed body reacted with the vegetation of the nearby swamplands, transforming him into Swamp Thing. Alex, now as Swamp Thing, swore that Damien would pay the price for his betrayal. Alex Olsen, as this new Swamp Thing, then burst through the windows of their home. He easily strangled Damien, killing him. Linda emerged in the room and began screaming in horror. The Swamp Thing turned towards her, but he was unable to tell her that he was in fact her lost husband, Alex. Alex, he then left. He abandoned his past existence. He preferred then to live in solitude in the swamplands that would become his home. So that is the initial Swamp Thing story of Alex Olsen, which supposedly took place in the early 1900s. This version would be ignored for now, though, and the following year, in 1972, we would get a new version of Swamp Thing named Alec Holland, who would of course be our main Swamp Thing going forward. So now, let's dive into that. In 1972, Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 1, Dark Genesis. Scientist Alec Holland and his wife, Linda Holland, are working in a secret cabin located in the Louisiana Swamplands. Their work is funded by a secret government organization known as Defense Department Intelligence, or DDI for short. Through their work, Alec and Linda Holland invent something called the Biorestorative Formula, designed to stimulate hormonal growth in plant life, enabling plants to grow in hostile terrain. This would solve any nation's food shortage problems. In those swamplands in Louisiana, they were being protected by DDI agent Matthew Cable. While doing their research there, some thugs, part of a criminal organization called The Conclave, which was being run by a man named Nathan Ellery. The Conclave and Nathan Ellery are going to be main antagonists of Swamp Thing over these first several issues. So Nathan Ellery and this Conclave has sent some thugs to buy Alec Holland's bio-restorative formula research. Alec refuses them. So then the thugs threaten him and Linda. Matt Cable, though, the agent that was sent to protect Alec and Linda, manages to scare the thugs off. A few days later, though, the Conclave thugs come back, without Matt Cable there, and they attempt once more to threaten Alec into giving up his research to the bio-restorative formula. Alec threatens to phone the police. The thugs do not like that. They knock Alec unconscious and then they plant an explosive underneath one of the laboratory tables. They figured that if Alec won't help them with the formula and they can't have it, then no one can. Alec, he manages to wake up and he notices the bomb. He tries to escape, but it is too late. The bomb explodes, dousing him with various chemicals of the bio-restorative formula, as well as flames. Alec, covered in the chemicals and the flames, heads outside, and he tumbles into the Louisiana swamp. He seemingly dies in the swamp water, but 
in the swamp. A mixture of the chemicals and the flames in the swamp water, Alec becomes the monster known as Swamp Thing. His body is now made up of plants. He is strong. He does not yet fully grasp all of his abilities, which will gradually expand as the series goes on. For now, although he maintains the intellect of Alec Holland, he does not yet know how to speak in this new body. A funeral is held for Alec Holland. Linda Holland and Matt Cable attend. Days later, Linda returns to the cabin, and the Conclave thugs come back, and they kill Linda, and Swamp Thing observes this, but he is too late to save his wife. In a rage, he attacks and kills all of these thugs sent by the Conclave and Nathan Ellery. Matt Cable then arrives shortly later, and he sees Swamp Thing there, and Matt Cable mistakenly assumes that Swamp Thing is responsible for the deaths of both Linda Holland as well as Alec Holland earlier. Matt Cable, he then vows to avenge their deaths by bringing Swamp Thing to justice. Matt Cable, he attempts to arrest Swamp Thing then and there, but Swamp Thing just leaves and descends into the swamp. Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 2, The Man Who Wanted Forever. In the second issue of Swamp Thing here, we are introduced to Swamp Thing's main villain, Anton Arcane. Anton Arcane is an evil mad scientist obsessed with immortality. He now lives in an ancient castle, Castle Arcane, somewhere in the Balkans. He spent decades studying science and sorcery, mastering magic. Much later on, we also learn he was a Nazi for a period of time. He conducted bizarre experiments, and through his experiments, he manipulated the genetic stock of random humans and created a subspecies race of mutated freaks. These freaks are called the Unmen, and these Unmen follow Arcane's orders, and they are typically too dim-witted to think for themselves. Eventually, Anton Arcane, through all of his science and sorcery and magic, achieved immortality. However, despite being able to be immortal himself, he is now old, and his body is too old and feeble, and is no longer a suitable vessel to carry him through eternity. Observing from an ancient mystic mirror in his castle, Arcane witnessed Alec Holland's transformation into Swamp Thing, and he dispatched his Unmen to capture Swamp Thing for him, as he would like to use Swamp Thing's body as a vessel for him to live on in eternity, as Swamp Thing is very powerful. So the Unmen somehow fly to Louisiana from Europe there, and they capture Swamp Thing, and then they fly back to Europe to Arcane's castle, and Matt Cable saw them taking off with Swamp Thing, and now he follows them to Europe. And now that Anton Arcane has Swamp Thing in his castle, he tricks Swamp Thing by offering Swamp Thing the ability to become human again. And in exchange, Arcane will take Swamp Thing's body. Swamp Thing is down, he is interested in this, so Arcane uses some magic item called a Soul Jar, and it seemingly works. Swamp Thing is Alec Holland again. And Arcane's body is now like Swamp Thing's. However, Alec overhears Arcane's sinister hidden agenda to destroy the town below his castle that never believed in him before. Now that he has this new powerful body, he can finally get the respect that he craves. Alec Holland won't stand for this, so he destroys the soul jar, and Arcane becomes old again, and Alec returns to being Swamp Thing. And then they have a battle, and in the course of that battle, Arcane is thrown out of the window of his castle and falls to his apparent death. Although, spoiler alert, Arcane is going to seemingly die and come back to life again and again and again. That is kind of like his thing, so we will see more of Arcane again in the future. Swamp Thing Volume 1 Issue 3 The Patchwork Man Swamp Thing, still in Castle Arcane there in the Balkans, comes across a zombie Frankenstein-like man named the Patchwork Man, whose real name was Gregory Arcane. 
the Patchwork Man, is Anton Arcane's brother, and he was held prisoner in the dungeons of Castle Arcane by his brother for years. The Patchwork Man is a sympathetic character, another sad victim of the experiments of Anton Arcane. At one point, Swamp Thing is going to fall down this cavern in the castle, but the Patchwork Man tries to help Swamp Thing up, but Swamp Thing falls anyway. The Patchwork Man, now exploring the castle, is angry that he was a prisoner of his brother for all these years, so he destroys the lab and the experiments of his brother, and he causes the castle to explode. In the nearby town, at the bottom of this castle there in the Balkans, Matt Cable has arrived, following Swamp Thing here and continuing his search for him. In the course of investigating the town, Matt Cable meets a woman named Abigail Arcane. Abigail Arcane is a major character in the Swamp Thing books. Abigail Arcane is the niece of Anton Arcane and the daughter of this patchwork man, Gregory Arcane. Abigail Arcane is a good person, an innocent. She is not fully aware of the extent of her uncle Anton Arcane's evil deeds. She is also unaware that her father has been turned into this patchwork man. When the castle explodes, Abigail becomes concerned because her uncle lives there. So she begins making her way towards the castle, and Matt Cable goes with her. On their way to the castle, Abigail's father, the Patchwork Man, knocks Matt Cable aside and kidnaps Abigail. Although not really kidnapping her, he merely wants to save and protect her and talk to her, as he hasn't seen her in years. He takes her with him. Matt Cable, he then returns to the townsfolk and riles them up about Abigail being abducted, and all of the townsfolk go with Matt Cable and begin hunting for Abigail with torches and pitchforks. Swamp Thing, he climbs the wreckage of the castle he fell down earlier, and as he reaches the top, he is face to face with the Patchwork Man and Abigail. He thinks that the Patchwork Man is kidnapping Abigail, so he fights the Patchwork Man to try and save her. As they are fighting, Matt Cable with the townspeople arrive with their pitchforks and torches. In all of the anarchy and confusion of the fighting, Abigail, she begins to slip, and she is about to fall into this cavern below. She is hanging on for dear life. The Patchwork Man and Swamp Thing end up stopping their fighting and work together to rescue Abigail. The Patchwork Man reaches to save his daughter, and then he looks into his daughter's eyes, and Abigail looks into his eyes, and she realizes that this Patchwork Man is actually her father, Gregory Arcane. Swamp Thing pulls Abigail up to safety, and the Patchwork Man falls down into the caverns below, presumably to his death. Matt Cable with the townsfolk confronts Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing then gives Abigail to Matt Cable and then disappears. In the aftermath, Abigail and Matt Cable are talking. Abigail tells Matt that she wants a new start. She says that with both her father and her uncle dead, there's nothing more to keep her here. She says that she would rather go with him. Maybe his organization could find use for her somewhere? Matt allows this. They eventually charter a private plane to fly them home. And Swamp Thing, he hitches a ride as a stowaway on that plane. Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 4, Monster on the Moors. Now, I went pretty detailed on the last three issues, but I'm going to start going through some of these issues a lot faster, as a lot of them are not that important to the overall story. So, in this issue, on the plane ride home, they ended up crashing in Scotland. And when they were in Scotland, there were werewolves there for some reason. Swamp Thing deals with the werewolves and saves Matt Cable and Abigail from them, and then he goes on his own way. Even though Swamp Thing has saved Matt Cable and Abigail's life from these werewolves, Matt Cable still holds Swamp Thing responsible for the deaths of Linda and Alec Holland. 
So when Abigail questions him on his motives of still wanting to hunt Swamp Thing down, and why is he not showing gratitude, Matt Cable tells her, Gratitude is only for the innocent, Abigail. Something that monster is not. He killed my friends, and someday, somehow, I'm going to make him pay. Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 5, The Last of the Raven Wind Witches. Swamp Thing is now trying to get home from Scotland to America still. So he stows away on a merchant vessel, leaving Europe bound for America. Mid-voyage, though, he is discovered, and the crew of the ship begins attacking him. He fights them off, and he leaps into the sea, where he eventually washes ashore near the hills of Divinity, Maine, a small, isolated town, somehow stuck in the cultural confines of the 17th century. And in the course of this issue, there is a whole one-off story with some witches. At one point in the issue, Swamp Thing's arm gets cut off, but it grows back. Swamp Thing is amazed at his new body and its abilities. Swamp Thing's arm being cut off, though, is something that is going to be revisited again many issues from now, years later. Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 6, A Clockwork Horror Swamp Thing, now back in America and having dealt with those witches, is kind of just exploring around and he eventually finds a small town in Vermont. A town filled with robot duplicates of people created by the town's mayor, Hans Klockman. The entire town is filled with robot citizens, patterned after the faces discovered in newspaper obituaries. So this Hans Klockman guy would read obituaries and be like, Hey, I'm gonna make a robot that looks like that person. And somehow this crazy clockmaker makes these amazing, sentient, lifelike robots. I kind of noticed a pattern these last three issues. A small secluded town of werewolves, then a secluded town stuck in the 17th century with witches, and now a secluded town filled with robots. So a lot of these early Swamp Thing adventures seem to involve him finding some sort of secluded group of people with some sort of monster or creature for him to deal with. In this town, Swamp Thing, he finds robot duplicates of himself, Alec Holland, and his wife, Linda Holland, which really trips him out. Apparently, this Hans Klockman guy, he read the obituary of Alec and Linda Holland, and he made them in this town. Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane, they show up in Vermont in this small town as well as they heard of a Swamp Thing sighting here, and Matt Cable is still determined to investigate Swamp Thing and bring him to justice. Also, the Conclave criminal organization, headed up by Nathan Ellery. Well, this Conclave organization, the same one responsible for the deaths of Alec and Linda Holland, well, they have been monitoring Matt Cable's activities for some time now and they tracked Matt Cable coming to this village. So, they send a task force to this village, as they want to kill Swamp Thing and somehow get this bio-restorative formula from him. So before you know it, the town of these robot duplicates is overrun with this Conclave task force. They capture Matthew Cable and Abigail, and take them away for interrogation to Gotham City. The remaining Conclave Task Force agents openly attack and kill everyone in the town, including Mayor Hans Klockman, and in the confusion, Swamp Thing manages to get away. But the entire town of lifelike robots are destroyed. Swamp Thing, he overheard the Conclave agents mention that they kidnapped Matthew Cable, and they took him to Gotham City to be interrogated. So Swamp Thing figures he must go to Gotham City and free him. Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 7, Night of the Bat Swamp Thing arrives in Gotham City. He is trying to track down Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane, who have been kidnapped by the Conclave, as they want information from them on the bio-restorative formula. 
Swamp Thing, when he arrives, wants to hide his appearance, so he breaks into a store and disguises himself up in a yellow trench coat. Some police officers, though, spot him, and they begin shooting at him for robbing the store. But the bullets don't hurt Swamp Thing, and he tosses the cop's police car aside, and then he disappears down an alley. Meanwhile, Batman is investigating this conclave criminal organization, and trying to find the identity of its leader. He beats up some low-level criminals trying to get answers. Elsewhere, Nathan Ellery, the secret leader of the Conclave, is getting a ride across town in his limousine to his secret base. He also has a ferocious pet monkey with him. When he arrives at his base, Matt Cable and Abigail are being interrogated by electrocution. Nathan Ellery supervises some of the interrogation, but Matt and Abby still refuse to talk. Batman is speaking to James Gordon, and he learns of this Swamp Thing in their city and his run-in with the police earlier. Swamp Thing, as he is walking the streets of Gotham City, eventually learns of the location the Conclave is keeping Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane. So Swamp Thing pursues that lead and arrives and manages to free Matt and Abby. And then Swamp Thing questions the interrogator and learns the location of the Conclave leader, Nathan Ellery. So Swamp Thing begins heading over to Nathan Ellery's place. But that is when Batman finally intercepts him. Swamp Thing wants to reason with Batman, but Batman just immediately starts fighting Swamp Thing. They trade some blows in an alley. Swamp Thing absorbs Batman's punches, but he sees no way to reason with Batman, so he just knocks the wind out of him and then heads on. Eventually, Swamp Thing arrives at the top floor of a large building. He's on the balcony there, and there he meets the leader of the Conclave, Nathan Ellery. Batman also managed to find his own way up there as well. Swamp Thing confronts Ellery. He is thinking of killing him for what he and the Conclave did to him and his wife. But Swamp Thing decides that he doesn't want to be a killer and he lets Ellery live. As Swamp Thing lets Ellery go, Nathan Ellery accidentally steps on his pet monkey's foot, and the pet monkey bites him, and it causes him to stumble some more, and he eventually falls off the balcony to his death. That's not Swamp Thing's fault, though. That's the monkey's fault. Swamp Thing has a clear conscience in this guy's death right now. Swamp Thing then disappears into Gotham City, and Batman loses trace of him. Batman then thinks to himself at the end of the issue, Ellery's gone, and apparently there was a lot more to the man than I suspected. A lot of things I'll have to check out. And Swamp Thing's gone too. I suppose I should hunt him down again, but I'm betting his work is finished in this town, just as I'm betting there's a lot more to him as well. Maybe someday I'll take the time out to find out what it is. So this issue seemingly wraps up the loose end of this Nathan Ellery and Conclave subplot that was introduced in issue one. So now Swamp Thing has fully gotten his revenge on all of those responsible for his wife's death. I'm going to be skipping by the next two issues really quickly. Issue eight, The Lurker in Tunnel 13, is another Monster of the Month issue where Swamp Thing goes to some secluded town and has to deal with this monster that is in the mine in town. Issue 9, The Stalker from Beyond, is a kind of convoluted storyline dealing with UFOs. Issue 10, though, is an important one, as it marks the first return of Anton Arcane. So Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 10, The Man Who Would Not Die. Swamp Thing wanders through a swamp until he finds an old black woman outside of a shack. Her name is Antebellum. She tells Swamp Thing a tale of the slavery days of a ruthless plantation owner named Samson Permenter, who frequently abused his slaves, including a woman named Elsbeth. But Elsbeth's lover, Black Jubal, fought against the owner to save her. As punishment, the slave owner had Black Jubal killed. As Black Jubal was dying, he swore an oath. He said that 
even death wouldn't stop him from dealing with Parmenter for good. He said that Parmenter's breed would pay in kind for the almighty sins they committed against their fellow man. The slave owner just laughed. However, many nights later, though, Black Jubal, seemingly from beyond the grave, came back and killed the slave owner, ripping him limb from limb. Shortly after hearing the woman's story, Swamp Thing moves on. He walks toward an old lost cemetery, and there he finds Anton Arcane, as well as some of Arcane's unmen. Anton Arcane is now a gross looking monster. Apparently, what happened to him is that in issue 2, when Anton Arcane fell from the castle down the cliff, his body had been destroyed, every bone broken. One of Anton Arcane's unmen, named Cranius, who was his first unman he ever created, a living brain with legs and a face on that brain, well, Cranius directed the other unmen to retrieve Anton's body. Anton Arcane then used his telepathic control to command his unmen to create a new synthetic body for him. They then transferred his mind into this new body. His new body is grotesque though, and Arcane is still obsessed with transferring his mind into Swamp Thing's body. Using Cranius's telepathic powers, they homed in on Swamp Thing's location, and they swam across the Atlantic Ocean to pursue Swamp Thing. They don't require food or sleep, so it did not take Arcane and his unmen very long. Swamp Thing and Anton Arcane now fight. It looks as if Anton Arcane and his unmen may be victorious in their battle. They knock Swamp Thing out. But then, the dead slaves, the one from the woman's story earlier, well, they rise from the dead, being led by this Black Jubal. When Black Jubal was dying, he vowed that death would not stop him from dealing with this Parmenter for good. And he also said that Parmenter's breed would pay in kind for the almighty sins they committed against their fellow man. Anton Arcane is a similar evil man as this slave owner, so Black Jubal would deal with him as well. Black Jubal and the other slaves then fight and manage to kill Anton Arcane once again, ripping his limbs apart and then burying them in separate graves. When Swamp Thing wakes up, he finds that there is all these new tombstones in the cemetery with Arcane's name written on blood on it. There is no sign of this antebellum woman he met earlier, or the shack that she lived in. And all of the other slaves that rose from the dead, they are gone too. Swamp Thing finds another gravestone there with the name Elsbeth Bellum etched onto it. Apparently, antebellum we met earlier was actually the ghostly lover of this black jubal, Elsbeth, from the initial story she told. Swamp Thing then travels on. Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 11, The Conqueror Worms. This issue is going to go off the rails a little bit. Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane are still looking for Swamp Thing in the swamps. With Swamp Thing having saved their lives a few times now, Matt Cable is starting to think that maybe there is more to this Swamp Thing than he believed initially. Swamp Thing maybe actually isn't responsible for Alec and Linda's deaths, but still, Matt Cable feels he is somehow connected to them and he wants answers. This issue, Matt and Abby get attacked and kidnapped by mutant worms or something that are actually the minions of this mad scientist named Zachary Nail, who is attempting to create a new Eden by abducting young, strong people to live and breed in an artificial domed city in a swamp. Kind of ridiculous. <laughs> when Matt and Abigail wake up from being attacked, they are with all of these other abducted people this mad scientist has kidnapped. One of the other men there is a man named Jefferson Bolt. 
Jefferson Bolt will become an ally of Matt and Abigail's for the rest of this run. Swamp Thing, he manages to save the day, save everyone again, and stop this villain. And then, randomly, at the end of this issue, Swamp Thing finds a mysterious gem with a seven-pointed star, and it teleports him back in time to the time of dinosaurs. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 12, The Eternity Man. Swamp Thing in this issue teleports through time, first in prehistoric times with dinosaurs, then he jumps to the Roman gladiator times, then in Europe during the Black Death, then the Civil War times in America, and lastly back to the current day. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 13, The Leviathan Conspiracy. Now this issue is an essential issue for the Swamp Thing story. It is the final issue of the creator of Swamp Thing, Len Wein's run on Swamp Thing. So he really goes out with a bang. Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane are once again searching for Swamp Thing in the swamps. They have brought with them Jefferson Bolt, whom we first met a few issues ago, as well as a scientist named Professor Coolidge de Grez. They have brought with them these foam guns, and with those foam guns, they manage to freeze and subdue Swamp Thing with them, and they capture Swamp Thing and bring him back to a secret military base outside of Washington, D.C. In that base, Swamp Thing is put into a hydroponic tank, where he is studied by that scientist, Professor Coolidge de Graz. Once Swamp Thing is set up there in the hydroponic tank, Matt Cable and Abigail are brought over to see him. Escorting Matt Cable is a commander named John Zero, who is a Defense Department intelligence agent and bureaucrat. So John Zero escorts them to Swamp Thing, and when Matt Cable and Abigail see how Swamp Thing is being treated, they are a little bit appalled by it. Professor de Grez tells Cable that Swamp Thing here will stay until they have completed their investigation of his origins. And then, who knows, maybe a place of honor in the Smithsonian, perhaps? Matt Cable, when he learns of their plans to kill Swamp Thing once they are done studying him, he grows angry. He says, you're going to kill it when you're done? Fat chance, Professor. Somehow, that monster is tied up with the deaths of Alec and Linda Holland, a case I was in charge of. And if you think I'm going to let you kiss off my star witness before I get to the bottom of that case, you are flat out crazy. Matt Cable and Abigail leave in disgust. Later that day, Professor DeGrez is studying Swamp Thing, observing him. He finds obvious signs of intelligent life in Swamp Thing and is fascinated by him. Swamp Thing, inspecting the tank he is in, manages to break out of the hydroponic tank by smashing through the glass. Some guards come in and they shoot at Swamp Thing. Professor de Graz, who was working on Swamp Thing, he gets in between Swamp Thing and the guards. He tells them, no, stop shooting. The creature mustn't be harmed. He's too valuable to science. The guards don't stop, though, and they accidentally shoot and kill Professor de Graz. The guards, they feel bad about this. They then switch to those foam guns that Swamp Thing was captured with earlier, and they spray him with it and subdue him once again, and they put him in a new hydroponic tank, this time with laser beams around it, which should keep him contained. Matthew Cable comes back later after the incident. Commander John Zero tells Cable that a funeral is going to have to be held for Professor de Graz, and he wants Matthew to personally handle the funeral services. Matthew Cable accepts this task. As he is talking to John Zero, he asks for permission to talk to Swamp Thing. He says, look, maybe I can find the answers that cost the professor his life. Maybe I can learn the secret of the Swamp Thing. I want you to clear everyone out of here and then put me in there with him so I can try and talk to the Swamp Thing alone. Even though John Zero is skeptical, he allows Matthew to talk to the Swamp Thing alone in the chamber. The arrangements 
are made. Matthew Cable is talking to Swamp Thing. He wants to know what Swamp Thing knows about Alec and Linda Holland. He's trying to save Swamp Thing's life here. If he can get information from Swamp Thing, maybe the other military scientists here won't kill him. Cable starts growing frustrated. He eventually says, Come on, answer me, say something. I know you're intelligent. You must be able to speak. Damn it, I'm trying to save your mossy hide. Speak to me. Swamp Thing, trapped in this hydroponic tank, thinks to himself, what should he do? He thinks, I wish I could tell Matt. Lord, I wish I could, but the secret I hold, the secret of the bio-restorative formula, is too dangerous for anyone else to learn. But, on the other hand, what choice do I have? If I don't confide in Cable, his colleagues will simply kill me and learn the secret by studying my corpse. No, I must tell Cable the truth. Swamp Thing. He then tries to speak. He struggles. Talking is painful for him, but he gets the words out. He says, I am Alec Holland. Matthew Cable then freaks out all of this time. He says, Alec, oh God, part of me always knew, I suppose, when we couldn't find your body in the ruins of the barn. Part of me knew but refused to admit it. How, Alec? How did it happen? Swamp Thing slowly tries to speak, and he manages to explain his whole story. Afterwards, Matt Cable goes back and tells Abigail the truth about Swamp Thing and how he is actually Alec Holland. Cable, he then thinks back to all of the dumb threats that Swamp Thing has saved them from over the course of this series. He says, if it weren't for Alec, the patchwork man, that crazy werewolf, that robot freak from the conclave, the alien, those hideous worms, any one of them might have finished us, yet those are all things that the Swamp Thing saved us from, believe it or not. Yep, Swamp Thing has saved them from a lot of weird shit over these last several issues. Cable and Abigail then decide that they owe Swamp Thing, they are going to break him out of that military base or die trying. They then return to that military base. They throw some knockout gas to put the guards to sleep while they wear a mask. Cable then uses a grenade to break the glass around Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing is freed from the hydroponic tank. Cable, he then comes up with a plan. They burn down the lab and they sneak Swamp Thing out in the casket of Coolidge de Grez, the scientist that they are going to hold the funeral for. So the next day, the funeral for de Grez is held. He had no family, so it was a quiet, quick funeral. Cable told Commander John Zero that the Swamp Thing died in the lab fire. So as far as the government knew, at least then, Swamp Thing was dead. And then at night, Swamp Thing arose from the grave. The government will hopefully leave him alone now that they think he is no more. Swamp Thing then travels to the cemetery to see the grave of his wife, as well as his own grave. And Swamp Thing thinks to himself that his wife's death is all of his fault. He thinks, if there is truly a heaven, sweet Linda, I pray to God you're happy there. And there must be a heaven because I know there is a hell. I'm living in that hell right now. Swamp Thing, he then heads on. He returns to the swamp. As he arrives in the marsh, he calls home. He pauses and he remembers Linda once more and the man that he used to be. He thinks that if the tears could come, they would, but he goes on. This is the end of Len Wein's run on Swamp Thing. The remaining issues of this first volume of Swamp Thing, issues 14 to 24, were written by David Michelani and Gary Conway. A lot of the rest of these issues are not that good, are mostly filled with filler, monster of the month kind of things, and the sales figures really started plummeting towards the end of this series. So the writers, in an attempt to revive interest, started introducing even more fantastical creatures, more aliens, 
They revert Swamp Thing to go back to being Alec Holland for a while, trying to give him a happy ending. They would soon reverse that, though. And they also introduce Alec Holland's brother, Edward, whom they soon forget about and pretend never happened. So let's power through now the back half of this first volume of Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 14, The Tomorrow Children. Swamp Thing becomes involved with some strange kids who have telekinetic powers thanks to an evolutionary experiment. Soon enough, he's protecting them from the angry townspeople who have developed a mob mentality towards them. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 15, The Soul Spell of Father Bliss. In this one, a priest has become a black magician. He lets his body get taken over by this demon, while his soul is stored in a mystical globe. Swamp Thing, Abigail, and Matt get involved and save the day. Swamp Thing, Abigail, and Matt still seem to be drawn together and go on various adventures. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 16, Night of the Warring Dead. On a Caribbean island of Calopago, a high priestess named Lagana, with some voodoo magic, raises a zombie army and attacks the military government of this island. Swamp Thing comes on the scene, though, and destroys the high priestess's voodoo talisman, crumbling her zombie army to dust. Elsewhere on that Caribbean island, an old enemy of Swamp Thing, the conclave leader known as Nathan Ellery, is somehow still alive. He survived his fall out of the building in Gotham City in issue 7. He is now wheelchair-bound, though. He has established a secret base defended by advanced robotic sentries. Nathan Ellery, together with an accomplice named Dr. Pretorius, has kidnapped Swamp Thing's ally, Jefferson Bolt, and is attempting to wrest the secret of Alec Holland's bio-restorative formula from him. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 17, The Destiny Machine. So, Conclave leader Nathan Ellery soon manages to also kidnap Matt Cable and Abigail as well, in addition to Jefferson Bolt. So he's got all three of them. Nathan Ellery, he no longer cares about this bio-restorative formula anymore, thanks to this scientist, Dr. Pretorius, as Pretorius has invented a machine called the Ultra Cerebralocitor, which somehow has the ability to target all humans in the world who have something called an E-Wave in their brain. An E-Wave is apparently a genetic thing that is tied to leadership in humans, so humans that have this E-Wave are naturally born leaders, where everyone else is just a follower. So somehow this machine can target all the leaders in the world with this E-Wave and make them all stupid, turning their brain to mush. All except for Nathan Ellery, who will be protected here. Thus, when everyone else who is a natural leader in the world has their brain turned to mush, Nathan will come in and become the new de facto leader in the world. Look, it's dumb. I know it's dumb. This is what happened, though. <laughs> this machine is so ridiculous. Swamp Thing, he fights through the advanced robotic sentries of Nathan Ellery's on this island. Ellery has a robotic octopus, a flying robot snake that fires lasers, robot wolves, etc. Swamp Thing makes his way to Nathan Ellery. He grabs him and tosses him around. He then saves Jefferson Bolt, Matt, and Abby. Swamp Thing, once again, did not directly kill Nathan Ellery, but Nathan Ellery, in his wheelchair, accidentally runs over some high-voltage wires, and he electrocutes himself. And this time, he dies for reals. Swamp Thing, Matthew, Abigail, and Jefferson steal one of Nathan Ellery's helicopters and fly away from this island. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 18, Village of the Doomed. Swamp Thing, Matthew, Abigail, and Jefferson have flown from that Caribbean island and they now arrive in Florida. But they have to crash land as they have run out of fuel. When they land, they travel to a place called Serenity Village. Once again, another story of a strange secluded town full of weird people. Serenity Village is a home for aged people who have regained their youth by using black magic to leech it from younger people. 
Some shenanigans go down in this town. Matthew, Abigail, and Jefferson get kidnapped once again, and Swamp Thing saves them again. In the aftermath of this issue, Swamp Thing then goes into the Florida Swamp. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 19, A Second Time to Die, and Issue 20, The Mere Monster, is a two-part story. Way back in Issue 5, the last of the Raven Wind Witches issue, Swamp Thing's arm got cut off. It was no big deal, though, it just grew back. But somehow, a mindless Swamp Thing has grown from that lost arm, and now both the original Swamp Thing and this mindless duplicate of Swamp Thing are wandering the world, and they now both arrive in Gatorsburg, Florida, both drawn to the same town, but they are unaware of each other's existence. Throughout the course of these two issues, the real Swamp Thing and the duplicate clash in battle, with Matt Cable, Abigail, and Jefferson Bolt on their trail. At some point, the mindless Swamp Thing gets killed by the townspeople and they destroy him. Matt Cable, Abigail, and Jefferson Bolt witness this, and because of this, they mistakenly believe that the original real Swamp Thing has died. The real Swamp Thing, he just disappeared back into the swamps once again and did his own thing. But Matt, Abby, and Jefferson will go on believing that the real Swamp Thing has died for quite some time. In fact, they will not be seen again in the comics for several years after this. Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 21, A Requiem In this issue, Swamp Thing is teleported into space to become the captive of some sort of tyrant exiled from his home planet and now stuck on a floating platform-type spaceship. Once teleported to this spaceship, Swamp Thing is kept in a tube along with other captured creatures from other planets. They eventually all break free and the tyrant who captured them gets killed when he drifts off the spaceship into space, and Swamp Thing teleports back to the Earth to the western United States. Swamp Thing Volume 1 and Issue 22, The Solomon Plague Swamp Thing, now in the western United States, is captured by some weird governmental program that that seems to be housing mutants in a secret underground bomb testing site. Swamp Thing eventually escapes, though. And as he is traveling, he is near the mountains of Oregon, and he arrives at his brother Edward Holland's home. The next two issues are really batshit insane, and they make some wild choices for Swamp Thing and really change up the status quo in a kind of bad way which would later get reversed and kind of retconned, and we just sort of pretend it never happened. And I thought this was so funny. Len Wein, the creator of Swamp Thing, and he later became the editor in a letters column in the next iteration of Swamp Thing, literally wrote to a reader, pretend issues 22, 23, and 24 never happened. <sighs> but these next two issues, even though they are retconned, are fascinating. So I'm going to break it down for you all. So here we go, Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 23, Rebirth and Nightmare. Swamp Thing wanders into his brother Edward's home. He meets his brother's research assistant, Ruth Monroe. Ruth has a similar appearance to Swamp Thing's dead wife, Linda, so it's kind of weird. Swamp Thing then meets his brother, who is initially freaked out, but then Swamp Thing explains the situation and how he is really Alec Holland, and how he came to be this monster. Edward decides he is going to help his brother return to human form again. When Ruth Monroe questions if Edward is going to be able to pull this off, Edward says that he is twice the chemist his brother Alec is, or ever was. So Edward gets to work, and three days later, that's all it took him, he's ready. He has learned how to reverse Swamp Thing's curse and make him back to Alec Holland. So they then prepare for this transformation. Various chemicals are set up, and a bomb is placed to recreate the explosion that created Swamp Thing in the first place. 
the bomb and the bio-restorative chemicals, I assume, blow up and douse Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing, he then runs over to a pool of water set up in the backyard, and he dives into it. And that is when a random character arrives. Way back in issue 13, we were introduced to a nothing character named Commander John Zero. He was Matt Cable's boss or something. He, he worked in that secret government agency they're all a part of. Well, John Zero was a government bureaucrat. And ever since Swamp Thing supposedly burned up in that lab, his life has turned to shit. And now he's become a villain named Saber. He also at some point lost his hand, and now he has a cool Saber sword thing for a hand. He is part of an evil organization called Colossus, and he no longer works for the government. Also part of this Colossus group is, I assume, their leader named Councilman Red. Also, there is the genetically engineered man named Throdvang. <laughs> so John Zero, or Saber now, removes his mask, and he confronts Swamp Thing. He tells him, well, Look at me, monster! Look at the face of the man you destroyed! I'm John Zero, a cipher, a bureaucrat, a nobody until you came along, and you've ruined everything! Capturing you was my greatest accomplishment! Monster, the finest moment of my career! And then you were lost in an explosion, presumed dead! And all my dreams and my hopes, everything I ever worked for, died with you. At first, nothing changed. But slowly, I began to receive fewer assignments, less responsibility, more paperwork. My bosses were easing me out, replacing me with a younger man. And why? Because of you. Swamp Thing then starts fighting John Zero, Ruth Monroe. She tries to interfere and help Swamp Thing by holding John Zero back. And John Zero, he whacks her and he tells her, Witch! No one touches Saber! No one! <laughs> I think it's so funny. He's talking in the third person! Oh, Swamp Thing, he then pushes John Zero into some flames, where John Zero burns. He will live, though. Then Swamp Thing starts transforming back into Alec Holland. He is now human. Edward Holland then proclaims, Alec Holland lives again! Swamp Thing, Volume 1, Issue 24, The Earth Below. This is the final issue of the first volume of Swamp Thing before it got cancelled. Councilman Red, the leader of this Colossus group, springs Saber from jail and reveals to him their plan to build an invincible army of Swamp Things. Meanwhile, Alec Holland is adjusting to being human again. Ruth Monroe, who looks similar to Linda Holland, seems really into Alec. One day, they leave Edward at home and drive into town. Edward seems upset when they leave, as he is jealous of his brother Alec. And he also seems to have the hots for Ruth, and Ruth seems more into Alec than him. Edward thinks to himself as they drive away from him. Alec and I have always been rivals. While he won all the research grants, government chemistry contracts, and recognition, I went completely ignored. And now he's back from the dead. And already the pattern starts anew with Ruth. Well, it's not going to happen again, Alec. Not again. Wow, they're really setting up an evil heel turn with Edward. Although, like I said earlier, they are going to soon ignore that Edward ever existed and never mention him again. Anyway, Alec and Ruth, they go and enjoy their day, but then they get attacked by the mutant enforcer of this Colossus group named Thrudvang, and they battle a bit. At some point, Alec and Ruth get away from this Thrudvang, and they have a moment to themselves. And then, very melodramatically, Ruth says to Alec, Alec, are you alright? You're in pain. And Alec tells her, That's not important, Ruth. Just listen to me. And then Ruth tells Alec, No, Alec, I won't listen. You're not some kind of martyr. You're a man. And I won't let you suffer alone anymore. And then Ruth kisses Alec and they make out. Anyway, Thrudvang catches up with him. He fights Alec. And their fight leads to a rope bridge, which Alec cuts the rope bridge and Thrudvang falls to his death, I assume. 
and Alec and Ruth, they hold each other. And that is the end of the original Swamp Thing run. The book would then be cancelled there in September 1976. About a year or so later, Swamp Thing would then appear in a book called Challengers of the Unknown in issues 81-87. to 87. In that book, they reversed Alec Holland being human and reverted him back into being Swamp Thing. I believe the explanation for why that was was something to do with he would have to continuously self-medicate with the bio-restorative formula, and if he did not do that, he would revert back into being Swamp Thing, so that's kind of what happened. So he's back to being Swamp Thing now. He helped out the Challengers of the Unknown for a few issues with some various threats there, and then he had a few sporadic appearances in some team-up books here and there, but that would basically be it for several years for Swamp Thing. Then, in 1982, the Wes Craven movie Swamp Thing, loosely based on the comic book, came out. It had mixed reviews, and it currently has a 5.3 on IMDb, which is really bad. I watched the movie. It is not that good. It is pretty campy, and it is kind of a bastardization of the source material. So, if you're going into the movie wanting to see a more direct comic book adaptation, this is not that. In the movie, Matt Cable is now Alice Cable, and she is a love interest for Swamp Thing. And Anton Arcane is kind of merged with Nathan Ellery's character, and he is the leader of a paramilitary organization who wishes to control Holland's formula for his own purposes. And they all fight in the swamp. At one point, Swamp Thing somehow heals this child by touching him, a power that I did not see in the comic book before this. But even though the movie was bad, DC thought, you know what? It would be a good idea to publish more Swamp Thing. Thus beginning the second Swamp Thing series, which would begin publishing in 1982. Writer Martin Pasco would begin the run, and he would write for 19 issues before, finally, Alan Moore would eventually take over and begin his critically acclaimed historic run on Swamp Thing, which would begin with issue 20. But before we get to Alan Moore, we gotta cover the 19 issues of Martin Pascoe's run. And I gotta warn you, a lot of this run is pretty rough, but it does lead into Alan Moore, so if you want to fully enjoy Alan Moore, it's nice to know what happened right before he took over. So let's dive into volume 2 now. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 1. What peace there may be in silence. Swamp Thing has now been wandering around the swamps of America for many years, a mysterious figure. A reporter named Liz Tremaine even wrote a book on Swamp Thing called Swamp Man, Fact or Myth. Swamp Thing has recently traveled to Limbo, North Carolina, where he stumbles across a bear that was going to attack three hunters. Swamp Thing, wanting to save the hunters, attacks the bear. The hunters are startled by Swamp Thing's appearance, though, and they turn their weapons on him. The weapons are meaningless to Swamp Thing, and he easily disarms the men. But one of the men does chop off Swamp Thing's hand. This does not matter to Swamp Thing, as his hand will just grow back. With the hunters saved, Swamp Thing walks on. A little girl in town is named Karen Clancy. She seems a harmless mute, but there is hints that she is possibly a satanic figure or the Antichrist or something. At this initial time, we are not sure what the deal with her is. But her dad certainly seems to think she is evil. Her father has her under a dock. He recently shot Karen's mother, and is threatening to shoot her. Now you might think the father is an evil person, but eh, we'll soon learn he seems actually kind of justified. Something is definitely up with this Karen. The father says to his daughter Karen, I'm sorry child, sorrier than you'll ever know, but it had to be done. Your mama's better off dead, and so are you. You probably don't know what you are. Maybe you don't even realize what you've done, but I do, and I gotta take the blame, cause I'm your pa. I made you. If I'm wrong about you, I'm damned for a sinner, but if I'm right, 
and I let you live anyway? I'll burn in hell for sure. May God have mercy on you, girl. Swamp Thing just so happens to be walking by, and he interferes and saves the girl. The father thinks his daughter conjured up this Swamp Thing. In the ensuing struggle, Swamp Thing kills the father. He didn't want to kill the father, but the father wouldn't stop fighting him. Although perhaps the father was influenced by his potentially satanic daughter to fight harder than he would have liked to. The entire time, Karen is emotionless and silent in a creepy way. Karen seems to influence Swamp Thing, and Swamp Thing all of a sudden finds himself caring for her. He takes her by the hand and walks her to town. He is going to bring her to the sheriff's office. However, while walking to town, a car accidentally drives into Swamp Thing. The townspeople, seeing the car crash and seeing Swamp Thing, jump into action. They grab their pitchforks, shotguns, and light brooms on fire. A fight is about to go down. Stepping away from that for a moment, there is a character named Avery Sunderland. He is the president and CEO of the Sunderland Corporation, a scientific research firm that works closely with the government agency known as DDI. That was the agency that funded Alec and Linda Holland's research and also employed Matt Cable. Avery Sunderland is going to be a very important character this volume, and the Sunderland Corporation is going to constantly be in the story. This Sunderland Corporation seems to want to capture or kill Swamp Thing and figure out the deal with this bio-restorative formula. One of Sunderland's employees is a man named Harry Kay, also known as Helmet Cryptman. He is also in that North Carolina town. He is here following Swamp Thing's trail. He is a physician of questionable integrity. He sees all of the commotion going on outside of the townspeople fighting with Swamp Thing, and he telephones one of his superiors, a man named Grasp, also known as Walter Ellenbeck. Harry Kay tells Grasp that Swamp Thing has been sighted in town, and it looks like he is getting into a brawl with the locals. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 2, Something to Live For the townsfolk, when they see this Karen girl, they recognize her as some sort of witch girl. Karen seems to have a reputation among the locals. There are whispers about her being some sort of creepy child. The locals are fighting Swamp Thing, and Swamp Thing is fighting them back. Harry Kay, sensing that Swamp Thing seems to care for this Karen child, decides to chloroform and kidnap Karen and take her with him in his red car. He wants to use her as bait to lure Swamp Thing to him. So Swamp Thing, he continues fighting the locals, but he eventually manages to lose them, and he follows the trail of Karen. He eventually finds the red car that she was taken in at the edge of a cornfield. Swamp Thing, he enters the cornfield, and all of a sudden, a plane flies above him, spraying him with a defoilant spray. Swamp Thing, he then gets subdued and captured, and when he wakes up, he is tied down in a secluded Sunderland building. Grasp, the man that Harry Kay was talking to last volume, is there with Swamp Thing. It appears that Grasp has mechanical hands. Grasp, he is planning on cutting up Swamp Thing so that he can find out some secrets of the bio-restorative formula. Before he does, though, he orders his man, Harry Kay, in another room to kill this Karen girl. As Harry Kay is about to kill Karen, Karen somehow uses some sort of telekinesis powers to cause Harry to trip into some window drapes, which causes him to fall and hit his head and be knocked out. Karen also uses her powers to loosen the restraints that were tying Swamp Thing down. So Swamp Thing, he manages to escape. He fights his way past the Grasp. He retrieves Karen, and they run away. Grasp, he follows them. He tries to hunt them down. They end up going to a nearby cave where Grasp falls and fails to get them. Swamp Thing and Karen get away, fleeing on a nearby train. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 3. A Town Has Turned to Blood.
While on the train, Swamp Thing and Karen get attacked by these punk vampires. Just randomly, they come across them. One of the vampires gets thrown off the train. One falls on a wooden slat from a smashed crate inside the train car, and it stakes and kills the vampire there. Swamp Thing, he's then fighting the last vampire, and they both fall off the train. Karen, she remains on the train, though, and the train is taking her away. Before she gets far enough, though, she uses her telekinesis powers to grab two pieces of wood and make a cross shape and stick it on a lamppost. And then the light from that lamppost with the cross symbol on it manages to burn and kill the last vampire that Swamp Thing is fighting. So Swamp Thing and Karen are now separated. Swamp Thing wants to find Karen once again and get back to her, but before he can, he has to go on a one-off adventure this issue where he helps this town deal with their vampire problem. Meanwhile, Karen is found by a reporter, Liz Tremaine, the one that wrote a book on Swamp Thing. Liz also works for the Sunderland Corporation. She is just a journalist for the Sunderland Corporation, though, and she is unaware of Sunderland's many shady business practices. Liz Tremaine on the news reports, I'm Liz Tremaine with another edition of In-Depth Magazine. Today we are in Pinboro, Arkansas, scene of a recent rash of grisly child slayings, and where apparently this abandoned mute child was recently found. This child slaying storyline will be picked up next issue. Swamp Thing, Volume 2, Issue 4, In the White Room Swamp Thing tracks Karen down thanks to her appearance on the news. He also seems to sense where Karen is, as Karen, using her mental powers, has some sort of psychic lock on Swamp Thing that draws him to her. In this new town in Arkansas here, there is a whole bunch of child slayings that Liz Tremaine was reporting on last issue. Apparently, a demon is responsible for these child murders. The demon possesses someone and then kills with them. The demon in this issue possesses the body of Liz Tremaine's associate producer, a man named Paul Feldner. The demon in possession of Paul's body kidnaps Karen. Karen is one of at least 12 children that has been kidnapped and killed recently. He brings her to a slaughterhouse, and Swamp Thing manages to track them down and intervenes, and fights and eventually defeats this demon in the slaughterhouse. Swamp Thing does this by offering his body as a host for the demon. The demon, he's into this, so he jumps out of this Paul Feldner's body and into Swamp Thing's body. But then Swamp Thing activates a hanging conveyor belt in the slaughterhouse, sending them both into the freezer. The cold in the freezer manages to kill this demon and knock Swamp Thing unconscious. Reporter Liz Tremaine and the local sheriff find Swamp Thing in the slaughterhouse unconscious afterwards and in rough shape. Liz is grateful that Swamp Thing solved these children killings and saved Karen. Liz, who works for the Sunderland Corporation but doesn't know about their sketchiness, sees that Swamp Thing is injured and is in need of medical attention. So she thinks that Swamp Thing should be sent for treatment at a Sunderland private medical clinic that seems to work wonders. Of course, by doing this, she is unknowingly sending Swamp Thing directly to his enemy. Unconscious Swamp Thing is then carried into an ambulance and driven to the private clinic owned by Sunderland. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 5 The Screams of Hungry Flesh Swamp Thing arrives by ambulance at the Barkley Clinic, which is the private clinic for treating Sunderland Corporation employees. Harry Kay is the one that runs this facility. He was the Sunderland employee that kidnapped Karen back in Issue 2. Here, Swamp Thing meets a doctor named Dennis Barkley. Dennis Barkley seems to be a good man. Dennis, he believes he has the power of psychic healing, and he seemingly treats Swamp Thing's wounds with only his hands, and Swamp Thing does start feeling better. Dennis Barkley is not actually a psychic healer, though. He doesn't actually know the truth of what is going on here. He, in actuality, has zero powers, although he thinks he does. What is going on here will be explained shortly. 
Later on that day, Liz Tremaine, the reporter, arrives at the clinic. She wants to meet Swamp Thing and see how he is doing and how the Sunderland Corporation is treating him. Swamp Thing, meanwhile, realizes that he seems to be locked in his room. He starts to feel like a prisoner. So Swamp Thing, he starts breaking his way through the facility. He then explores the facility and goes into the basement, where he makes a disturbing discovery that the lower level of this facility is filled with unconscious human clones. The clones are called receptors and are programmed to absorb the injury and sickness of their human counterpart through something called psychic empathy. So if someone is sick or injured, that injury gets instead absorbed by the clone psychic receptors instead. So hypothetically, if you were a Sunderland employee and you suffer a horrible disease or injury like getting burned in a fire, you will instead be perfectly fine and that pain will then transfer to this human clone that is a psychic receptor. This is all made up science that could no way work in real life. Apparently, the purpose of this program is to prevent any loss of productivity of Sunderland Corporation employees by keeping them healthy. It also negates Sunderland having to pay for health insurance for their employees, saving them millions in insurance every year. <laughs> I'm serious, this is actually explained in the comic by Avery Sunderland. Avery Sunderland at one point says, Harry K is doing some good work for us. That receptor thing he came up with saved us close to 40 million in fiscal 1981 alone. We were able to set up our own health plan that eliminated the need to deal with insurance companies or the medical establishment in any way. Oh man, so evil yet so fiscally prudent. Anyway, Dennis Barkley, he thought that he was doing psychic healing, but really this is what was going on. He would touch his hands to them thinking he was doing something, but really these psychic receptors were doing all of the work. Swamp Thing, he manages to team up with Liz Tremaine and Dennis Barkley, and he shows them what he discovered and what is really going on, and they are all disturbed by this. They disconnect all the clone receptors from their coma-inducing equipment, and they all try and escape, now fully aware that the Sunderland Corporation is evil. From now on, Liz Tremaine and Dennis Barkley will be fugitives from the Sunderland Corporation and will be hunted for what they found out here. They will also team up with Swamp Thing and go on wacky adventures. Harry K is back, and his goons confront Swamp Thing, Liz, and Dennis. He explains the true nature of the clones and how they are psychically absorbing the pain and injury of others. The Receptor clones, now no longer unconscious, awake. They seek revenge for the pain and suffering that has been inflicted on them by Sunderland here. Swamp Thing, Liz, and Dennis all manage to escape the facility in an ambulance, and Harry Kay, he narrowly escapes in a helicopter, and the remaining Sunderland goons left behind are then attacked by the remaining Receptor clones. Swamp Thing Volume 2 Issue 6, Sins on the Water so Karen has gone missing again. Swampy, Liz, and Dennis are trying to track her down. Dennis Barkley, he visits Karen's mom in a hospital. She was shot by her husband as mentioned in issue one, but she survived. Dennis, he wants to find Karen. So Karen's mom gives Dennis an amulet that will help them track Karen down. However, she tells Dennis, and when you find her, you kill her for God's sake kill her before it's too late. Karen's mom is either insane or she's speaking the truth and Karen's gotta die. Dennis, Liz, and Swamp Thing, they then go driving. They continue driving down the road until they encounter a roadblock forcing them to stop. The roadblock is fake and the police officers there are really there to abduct Liz for reasons. Dennis and Swamp Thing attempt to save her, but Harry K arrives in an attack helicopter and makes off with Liz. In the helicopter, Harry brings Liz to a luxury cruise ship owned by Avery Sunderland, the CEO of the company. Swamp Thing and Harry K make their way to that cruise ship too and try to save her. Liz gets drugged and then is put into a revealing bikini costume for the 
costume party they are having that night. At that costume party later on, we see many people wearing various outfits. And at midnight, all of the guests remove their masks, revealing they are non-human monsters with one red eye and tentacles for arms. This issue really went on some swerves I was not expecting. <laughs> Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 7. I have seen the splintered timbers of a hundred shattered halls. Avery Sunderland did not know that all of his guests were these weird aliens, so he goes to escape on a small boat. Harry Kay, he's going to go with Sunderland, but before he leaves, he has some ulterior motives. It seems like he is maybe not the Sunderland stooge that he appears to be. He secretly helps Dennis and Liz. He gives Dennis a gun to help fight off these weird aliens here. And then he leaves them be and he rejoins Sunderland on the escape boat. On the escape boat, he tells Sunderland that Barkley and Liz were killed by the creatures aboard the ship. So Harry Kay seems to be trying to protect them from being hunted by the Sunderland Corporation any further. Swamp Thing on the boat discovers a large sea monster in the depths of the ship. The sea monster tells Swamp Thing telepathically that he is a UFO that arrived first as a microscopic organism and then evolved into this. The alien now continues to try and spread its virus by infecting humans and destroying passing ships. He wants to attempt to rebuild its own spaceship and eventually go home. He is the source of all these weird one-eyed aliens aboard. Yada yada yada, in the end Swamp Thing then dives into the ocean depths and destroys this monster in a huge underwater explosion, killing it. Dennis, Liz, and Swamp Thing escape on a lifeboat and then find themselves on the shore of a strange Caribbean island that apparently has living dinosaurs. Swamp Thing Volume 2 Issue 8 Here's looking at you, kid. Swamp Thing, Dennis, and Liz are stranded on this Caribbean island, which apparently is populated by the materialized imaginings of six marines who are stranded here. And these six marines now create classic movie scenes with their minds. So that is why there are things like dinosaurs on this island, as well as King Kong and scenes out of other old movies like Casablanca. The marines stranded here fought in Vietnam where they came into contact with a chemical known as Agent Blue, which for some reason gave them these fantastical powers. And with these powers, they can create stuff out of thin air. They've just been living here on this island, messing around with these fantasy powers instead of going back to the real world. Swamp Thing, Dennis, and Liz get to the bottom of the situation here and end these soldiers' fantasy reality. And eventually, one of the Marines sympathetic to them conjures them up a helicopter with his mind. And then, Swamp Thing, Dennis, and Liz use the helicopter to go back home to America. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 9, Prelude to Holocaust Swamp Thing, Dennis, and Liz arrive back in America, and eventually they meet up with Harry Kay and his group. We learn, finally, confirmed now, that Karen is indeed evil, and she needs to die. Karen was manipulating Swamp Thing earlier the entire time, thinking that she could use him to protect herself, but she has since moved on and is psychically manipulating others to assist her, such as Paul Feldner, Liz's associate producer. Karen, she also starts looking older now. She seems more sure of her powers. She makes Paul Feldner burst into flames with her mind. And Paul, he screams, and he warns that the world is in danger from her. Karen, with her powers, somehow manages to grow into an adult. Paul does not die, though. Those psychic clone receptors will heal him. We also learn this issue that Harry Kay is actually good. This entire time, he never cared about Swamp Thing, which the Sunderland Corporation was after. He really, this whole time, just was focused on killing this Karen girl. Because Karen is, of course, the devil or the Antichrist or something. Karen, she then leaves and travels to Germany for the final part of her plan. Swamp Thing, Volume 2, Issue 10, Number of the Beast. Harry Kay tells Swamp Thing that 
His true mission is to destroy Karen. His work with Sunderland and his very identity is just a cover, a ruse. Karen has a mutation that gives her psychic powers, and she is very dangerous. Harry Kay convinces Swamp Thing, Liz, and Dennis to help him with his mission of killing Karen. They are at first skeptical, but eventually go along with him. They are all working together now. They all fly to Germany to confront Karen. Once they arrive in Germany, Karen is searching for something called Von Runestead's Pendulum, which she needs to complete her goals. When they see Karen, she is flying in the air, shooting fire from her mouth. She then raises an army of long-dead Nazi soldiers. She then destroys this entire old concentration camp in an avalanche of psionic fury. And then she disappears. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 11, Heart of Stone, Feet of Clay. So we learn that Karen is this Herald of the Beast, the Antichrist foretold in the Book of Revelation. Karen, meanwhile, she retrieved whatever pendulum she needed, and now she's ready for her final plans. Harry Kay and his allies construct a yellow golem to help them in their fight against Karen. The golem is an animated anthropomorphic being in Jewish folklore, which is usually created with clay or mud. So they created this golem to help them in their battle, but then the golem senses Karen's presence in a locket that Swamp Thing has that was the original locket that Karen's mom gave them, so the Golem and Swamp Thing end up having to battle. Next issue, Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 12, and yet it lives, Swamp Thing battles with this yellow Golem on the snowy cliffs, and Swamp Thing manages to deactivate the Golem by erasing one of the Hebrew letters inscribed on its forehead. In Hebrew, on the Golem's head, it had the letters E-M-E-T, meaning life, inscribed into it. Swamp Thing erased the first letter and turned it into the word Met, which is the Hebrew word for death. So the Golem is deactivated. They then put Karen's locket on the Golem and reactivate it, and now it is on their side to help them with their battle. Karen, she then telepathically sends Harry Kay and his team a message challenging them, so they head over to her. Also there in Germany is Grasp. He was a Sunderland employee we saw way back in issue 2. He is here on orders of Avery Sunderland to kill Harry Kay, Dennis, Liz, and Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing and the others track Karen down, and they finally battle her, and they manage to kill her. Swamp Thing snap in her body. However, Karen's body was merely the physical vessel for this evil entity known as the Herald of the Antichrist. So this evil spirit within Karen's body, her soul, her astral form or whatever, leaves her body. The demon entity briefly possesses Liz, and then it leaves her body and it attempts to take control of Swamp Thing's body. Swamp Thing's tremendous willpower casts the entity out though. The evil entity then seemingly transports Swamp Thing, Liz, Dennis, Harry, the golem thing they built, and Grasp who is now on their trail. So it transports them all to this huge metal fortress. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 13, Lambs to the Slaughter. So in this fortress now, this fortress of the beast, they are all battling this demon entity. The demon entity is attacking them with hallucinations and painful memories, which are traps to kill them. It is all honestly pretty convoluted to explain what happens in this battle. But in the end, Swamp Thing, he temporarily absorbs some of Karen's power somehow, he kills Demon Karen again, for real this time. He also kills Grasp, who is also possessed by this demon somehow as well too. So he kills them both, and now the world is saved and Armageddon is averted. And we can finally put this whole awful Karen the Demon Child Antichrist storyline behind us and move on. The fortress that they were transported to was apparently nothing but a telepathically induced illusion by this demon, that once the demon was killed, the illusion disappeared. In the aftermath of this storyline finally being over, Swamp Thing Liz, Dennis, and Harry Kay all travel back to America and return Swamp Thing to the swamp in Louisiana so he can restore and heal himself. Avery Sunderland, now aware of Grasp's death in Germany, plans on stepping up his efforts to kill Swamp Thing as well as the others. 
Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 14, Crystal Visions, Shattered Dreams, and Issue 15, Empire is Made of Sand, is a two-parter storyline that has Swamp Thing and Phantom Stranger teaming up to stop this other guy, Nathan Broder, who can somehow transform his body into a mass of living crystal. In the end, Swamp Thing and Phantom Stranger succeed. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 16, Stopover in a Place of Secret Truths. Swamp Thing discovers that his wife, Linda Holland, her body has been taken from her grave. He wants to get to the bottom of that. Who has her? Who took her? He assumes that the Sunderland Corporation is involved. Liz Tremaine, Dennis Barkley, and Harry Kay are all in danger now for what they know about the Sunderland Corporation, so they are all banding together as a team. Harry Kay, who knows the most of various details of the Sunderland Corporation from his time there, explains that Sunderland is engaged in a conspiracy to destroy Swamp Thing. They want to dissect him and reconstruct the bio-restorative formula and analyze his tissue, but it all goes much deeper than just the Sunderland Corporation. The orders come from even higher up, from someone within the United States government itself. The four of them all head to Washington, D.C., where they will try to learn more about the Sunderland Corporation and the overall government conspiracy. On their car ride to Washington, they eventually stop somewhere for the night. Liz, Dennis, and Harry all go to a diner to eat, and then they rent a motel and sleep for the night. While they are eating and sleeping for the night, Swamp Thing manages to squeeze in a random pointless crazy adventure. He meets a man with a chest full of soul masks, one of which appears to transform Swamp Thing back into Alec Holland. And as Alec, he falls in love with a beautiful blonde woman. He fights a red monster looking guy. And all these people with these soul masks in the town are actually mutant looking freaks that are ugly. And they use these soul masks to hide their hideous appearance. In the end, the freaks accept Swamp Thing as he is. And they tell him he can stay with them with the soul mask and be happy here. But Swamp Thing tells them that he can't stay. He has to help his friends and he says goodbye to them all. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 17, and Things That Go Bump in the Night. All right, three issues left in Martin Pascoe's run until Alan Moore's run finally begins. Honestly, I have not really been enjoying Martin Pascoe's run that much. I really felt he took way too long on the Karen Clancy Antichrist plotline. A lot of issues were a real slog to get through, but these last three issues of his run, I feel he really kind of steps up. He brings back a lot of fan-favorite characters, so Anton Arcane is going to make yet another comeback, as well as finally bringing back Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane into the story after many years being absent. Liz, Dennis, and Harry are all waiting for Swamp Thing near their motel as Swamp Thing returns from his crazy adventure last issue to meet them. All of a sudden, as he is returning to them, he just so happens to run across Abigail Arcane. Abigail is working at the diner in town. This is where she lives. We actually briefly saw her in the background last issue serving Liz, Dennis, and Harry in that diner. Well, when Swamp Thing sees Abby, he thinks to himself, Abby? Abigail Arcane after all these years? I can't believe it. Odds against running across her like this must be a million to one. Abigail, when she sees Swamp Thing, says out loud, Oh my god, Alec, it, it really is you, isn't it? They hug, and then they duck into a storeroom and talk. Abigail says that she thought Swamp Thing was dead. Way back in Volume 1, Issue 20 of Swamp Thing, the one where Swamp Thing was fighting a mindless duplicate of himself that grew from his severed hand. Well, Abigail and Matt Cable saw that duplicate get killed by the local townspeople and destroyed. So for all these years since then, they thought that that was the real Swamp Thing and that he was dead. Abigail explains all of this to Swamp Thing. And then she also explains that her and Cable ended up getting married. She is now Abigail Cable. 
Swamp Thing gathers his new friends, Liz, Dennis, and Harry Kay, and they all travel by car with Abby. They are driving to Abby's house to talk more, as well as to meet Matt Cable. Along their car ride there, though, they get attacked by some sort of powerful monster that apparently has materialized from Matt Cable's mind. I will explain more about these Matt Cable mind monsters in a few moments, but these monsters that materialize from Cable's mind attacks them. Swamp Thing, he fights them off a bit. Eventually, the monsters slip away. In all of the commotion, though, Harry Kay, he ended up running far away, and he got separated from the others. Even though Harry Kay is separated from the others and ran into the forest, the others all continue on to Abby's home. There, they meet Matt Cable. Only, this is not the same suave secret agent Matt Cable we were maybe used to in the first volume of Swamp Thing. This Matt Cable seems like a defeated man. He is an alcoholic and clearly not well. Abigail and Matt then explain what happened to them since we last saw them in issue 20 last volume, when they thought that Swamp Thing died. So, a guy named Dwight Wicker is the head of the government agency known as the Defense Department Intelligence. This is the agency that hired Alec and Linda Holland to create the bio-restorative formula. Also, they are the agency that was employing Matt Cable. So when Swamp Thing supposedly died there in issue 20 last volume, Dwight Wicker, he wanted everyone involved with the bio-restorative formula project dead. He deemed the whole thing a major fiasco. He wanted everyone that even knew about Swamp Thing dead, and the truth behind it to be defused, and all records and evidence of Holland's work to be destroyed. Some of the people who would have to be dealt with would be the DDI's own people, including Matt Cable. So Dwight Wicker, he subcontracted this dirty work out to an old friend and mentor of his named Avery Sunderland and the Sunderland Corporation. So that is the connection between the government organization known as DDI and Sunderland. They have been working together ever since very closely. Matt Cable and Abigail Arcane at some point after they thought Swamp Thing died, they got married. They were happy enough. At some point after that, though, DDI, they wanted to deal with Matt Cable. They perhaps thought it was maybe too obvious if they just killed Matt Cable directly. So instead, they tried something else. Dwight Wicker ordered Cable to go on a mission. That mission was a trap, though. When Matt Cable went on that mission, he was captured and put into a straitjacket. Cable was then sent to the very same Sunderland clinic that Dennis Barkley worked at earlier. You know, the creepy clinic with the receptor clones? Dennis Barkley, who didn't know any better, who was working at that clinic, treated Matt Cable. Dennis was told that Matt Cable was a paranoid schizophrenic, suffering from delusions, and electroshock was indicated as a treatment. So, they fried Matt's brain with shock therapy. They were trying to give him amnesia so that he would forget, but there were other side effects even beyond those to Matt. The DDI, they then spied on Matt, trying to see if their electroshock amnesia therapy worked. Matt Cable, though, he still seemed to remember everything. All of the secrets the DDI wanted him to forget about Swamp Thing and the bio-restorative formula. But Matt Cable, even though he still remembered those things, he kind of forgot how to be himself, how to be Matt Cable, how to be the crack investigator that they trained him to be. He was no longer the man he was, and he could no longer hold down a good job, only menial ones. Matt and Abigail, they then went on the run, trying to hide from the DDI and Sunderland, worried that they may try to kill them. They would take small odd jobs here and there, trying to get by, bouncing from city to city. This is why Abigail was working as a waitress in town. In the aftermath, Matt Cable's mind was so damaged, it somehow led to him gaining the ability to alter reality and create these little monsters or creatures with his mind. These weird creatures were what attacked them earlier. 
The monsters seem to come from Matt Cable's subconscious, so he is unable to control them. Matt Cable's marriage with Abigail started deteriorating, and Matt has become an alcoholic. He is washed up now, unable to provide for him and Abby. As Matt is explaining all this, the creatures from his mind begin attacking them all again. In the back of their house there, a monster materialized from Matt's mind, and it attacks Abby. She gets thrown around and gets injured by it. Swamp Thinky fights the monsters off, and eventually they just vanish. In the aftermath of this second attack, Swamp Thing is going to stay here and take care of Matt and Abigail. Meanwhile, Dennis Barkley and Liz Tremaine, they are going to drive back to their motel and pick up some medical supplies. Then they will return and help Abby with her injuries. So they have now kind of separated into two different parties. And while all that is going on, we gotta check back in with Harry K. Harry K, he got separated from the others earlier when he was trying to get away from those mind monsters of Matt Cable's. Harry, he ran into the forest and he stepped in a bear trap. And as he is stuck in that bear trap, Anton Arcane arrives. Anton Arcane has somehow, once again, been raised from the dead. How he pulled that off will be explained in the future issues. Anton Arcane has some sort of gigantic insect-like ship. Anton picks Harry up and tells him, I have been following you, watching you for some time now, ever since first learning that you too were searching for Swamp Thing. I have been waiting for the proper moment at which to show myself. Anton was hoping that Harry Kay would lead him back to Swamp Thing, as well as to Abigail. It took some time, but finally Swamp Thing and Abigail are together, so now is his time to strike. Anton brings Harry Kay into his insect ship, which is filled with even more of his unmen, who are now looking a little bit more insect-like. Anton tells his unmen, Come, my children, my new unmen, bring our guest aboard the craft and let him see what manner of hospitality he can expect from Arcane. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 18, The Man Who Would Not Die Matt Cable has managed to subdue his mind monsters for a while now. He has gotten a hold of himself. Cable, he tries to think through his ailment, and he thinks, what, they're gone? As if... They really had been delusions, but how can that be? They were real, they had form, substance. Unless, oh dear God, what if they were figments of my imagination, but real nonetheless? What if somehow, out of some self-destructive urge, I created them, and then my desire to live after all willed them away? While they are dealing with all of that, Arcane has Harry Kay captive. He tells Harry Kay about his last encounter with Swamp Thing, which we saw way back in Swamp Thing Volume 1, Issue 10. That issue ended with Arcane being killed by some ghosts of dead slaves that rose from the dead. His body was then torn into many pieces, each buried in a separate grave. Once Arcane is done retelling that story, he tells his unmen to prepare Harry Kay for the metamorphosis. Swamp Thing Volume 2, Issue 19, and the Meek Shall Inherit. This is the final issue in Martin Pascoe's run, and then finally Alan Moore will take over with Issue 20. Liz Tremaine and Dennis Barkley are driving back to the motel to pick up the medical supplies. But there is something wrong with their car. They crash, veer off the road, and land somewhere secluded. As they are stuck in that car, they talk. Eventually, they express their feelings for one another, and finally, they kiss. Back aboard Arcane's giant flying insect ship, Arcane continues telling Harry Kay how he returned to life. His body was in multiple pieces in separate graves. His unmen collected him, built him a new artificial body, even shittier than the body he had last time. Arcane, through some sort of science or magic, was somehow brought back to life in this body. Then Arcane 
tweaked his body and merged it with insects as he saw excellent possibilities with them. He also bred some new unmen, also merging them with insects. Harry Kay, he is now being cocooned. Arcane is going to turn Harry Kay into another one of his unmen. Harry Kay tells Arcane that he doesn't understand how Arcane was able to pull this off coming back from the dead. Arcane explains essentially that it was magic. He says, I am very old, very old, and in my time, I have learned almost all the secrets of the universe. Magic is nothing but advanced technology that is beyond the comprehension of the pathetically unsophisticated such as yourself. And so my science appears as mysticism to those who have not yet divined certain eternal verities. Arcane also reveals the scientific impossibilities of this insect ship they are in. He explains, This very craft, for example, its interior is larger than its exterior. It is, in effect, a kind of tesseract. In your world, Harry, such a space exists only in theory, but for me, it is a reality. So Anton Arcane, with this insect ship that apparently has a much larger inside than it appears on the outside, flies over to the cabin where Swamp Thing, Abigail, and Matt are staying. Eventually, they all start fighting, but Arcane has too many unmen with him. Matt, he gets knocked out in the fighting and left behind, and Arcane captures Swamp Thing and Abigail and brings them with him on his flying insect ship. In that ship, he has Swamp Thing trapped in a giant spider web. He also has Abby, and he is going to start cocooning her. Arcane, he is upset with Abby for abandoning their homeland. She is an Arcane. She is heiress to the Kingdom of the Earth, and she is not embracing her Arcane role. And by leaving their homeland, she has severed all ties to him. This angers him. And also, her allying herself with his enemy Swamp Thing is insult to injury. Abby is being cocooned. She is going to be made into another insect like Unman, just like Arcane is now doing with Harry. Arcane, he has a device there that will mind transfer his mind into Swamp Thing. This has been Arcane's motivation ever since the series began, it seems. As this is happening, Harry K starts chewing through the cocoon he is wrapped in. He is trying to get out of it. Arcane presses a button on this machine, and the mind transfer process begins. Harry K, he bites his way through his cocoon. He is now a half-man, half-insect. He still has his human mind for now, though. Harry K, he crawls over to Arcane's body, and Harry, he will do one last good thing before he dies. With his last breath, he propels himself forward, up into what would have been the exact locus of the mind exchange between Arcane and Swamp Thing. He interrupts the mind exchange process between Arcane and Swamp Thing, and Harry, he explodes in the middle of that, dying. Arcane's mind, his consciousness, departed his body mid-mind exchange. So Arcane's mind is now lost in the void, and Arcane's physical insect body is now mindless. It keels over and dies. And his insect unmen then eat him. Will this be the last we see of Anton Arcane? Is he truly dead this time? Eventually, Swamp Thing manages to get free from the cobwebs he was in, and he frees Abby too. They jump out of the flying insect ship, and they land in some water down below and swim to land. The flying insect ship then crashes. Swamp Thing and Abigail begin walking back to their cabin, where Matt Cable still is. Along the way, Swamp Thing tells Abby, Abby, go on ahead, something I have to do. Swamp Thing, he then walks and thinks to himself, before I do anything else, I've got to know if we'll really be safe from Arcane this time. 
I've got to be sure he's finally dead. I've got to see the body. And with this, we end Martin Pascoe's run. And next issue, Alan Moore will tie up loose ends, and then he will go full force into his Swamp Thing run, where he drastically shakes up the status quo of the character. Alright, so that was Swamp Thing the Bronze Age. What did you all think of these early Swamp Thing stories? Let me go through my thoughts on the various runs we had in here. So first, the Len Wein. I thought his run was pretty solid. We had the origin of Swamp Thing. We had the first two interactions with Anton Arcane, which were great. And then we had the uh, ending issue here where uh, Matt Cable finally learns that Swamp Thing is Alec Holland, which I thought was really impactful. Swamp Thing struggling to speak, and he gets the words out. I am Alec Holland. That was great stuff, man. Then we had David Michelani and Gary Conway doing the back half of that first volume of Swamp Thing, and their issues are a little bit weaker, a lot more one-offs with crazy creatures, lots of sci-fi stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, the last two issues of their run, where it gets really crazy, that it was retconned, where we have Edward Holland and uh, Swamp Thing being turned back into Alec and John Zero coming back as Saber. You know, those issues I think were, were they were bad, but I had a fun time going through them <laughs> and laughing at them and some of the uh, choices made there. So uh, crazy, not that great, those back two issues, but kind of fun, kind of fun to talk about. Um, and then we sort of have the Challengers of the Unknown, which I kind of skipped over those stories, but basically... Uh, Alec Holland is switched back into Swamp Thing. That's all we really need to know there. And then we have the Martin Pasco run, the 19 issues that lead into Alan Moore. So initially I was kind of digging it. This Karen girl who's like Satan, uh, a Satanist or something, she's like a demon. That was intriguing for a while, but uh, then the plot really kind of lost me and I was not caring and I just wanted to get through it. It went on way too long and I was too convoluted. So uh, I really did not like a lot of his run, uh, but I did like the last three issues or so where Matt Cable and uh, Abigail Arcane come back into the story. That was exciting. And Anton Arcane is back in the story and he's all like an insect now and he was terrifying looking. So all that was uh, actually pretty cool. And it sets up Alan Moore to pick up his run in a very interesting place. So while Martin Pasco, a lot of it I didn't like, I did enjoy the ending kind of. So. So kind of cool stuff. So yeah, those are my thoughts on the early Swamp Thing stuff, Swamp Thing, the Bronze Age. I'm not going to do my typical rating out of 10 because the issues are kind of all over the place, but I had a lot of fun breaking this stuff down. I hope you all enjoyed going through it. And uh, next week, I will be back with the first volume of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. So I will see you all then there for that. <laughs>